This video is brought to you by AppSumo, the leading digital marketplace for entrepreneurs. Hi, welcome to another episode of Cold Fusion, where I cover anything in science, technology, business or history. Imagine a device fraught with such complexity that it caused an Apple employee to sadly end his own life, and caused another employee to end up in prison. This happened in the early 1990s with the Apple Newton project, a mobile device with a touchscreen and apps. Apple was looking to start a revolution, but all they got was failure and personal disaster behind the scenes. So what happened? Why did the Newton fail and what can be learned? Sit back and get comfortable as we take a look into Apple's greatest failure. You are watching Cold Fusion TV. In 1992, Apple, then known as Apple Computer, was a completely different place to what it is today. Steve Jobs had been forced out of the company seven years earlier in 1985, and John Scully, previously of PepsiCo, was at the helm. He was a master of marketing, but didn't know much about technology, a fact that would prove disastrous later. Apple itself hadn't produced a hit product since the original Macintosh in 1985, and the company needed its next big break. The 1990s was an odd time for technology, a place before the smartphone and mainstream internet, but it was also a time after home computing had been well established. The hottest new idea for technology at the time was the Personal Digital Assistant, or PDA. Its aim was mainly to organise, schedule and plan. The first true PDA was released in 1991 by Poseidon. The next year in 1992, Apple would venture into this product category. The original idea for the Newton came from Apple engineer Steve Sackerman. He had some previous experiences in portable technology after building the HP 110, the world's first battery-powered Microsoft-based PC, and it was released in 1984. In Sackerman's view, there was a hidden future beyond the PC. Steve Jobs liked what Sackerman had done with the HP portable computer and would hire him at Apple to create a portable version of the Macintosh in 1984. The next year, however, Steve Jobs was forced out of Apple, and without the guidance of Jobs, Sackerman became disillusioned with an Apple. He was reduced to overseeing the hardware teams for the Apple II and Macintosh product lines. He was tempted to leave Apple as he was bored with the work, but fellow Apple employee Jean-Louis Gassi convinced Sackerman to build a team within Apple to experiment with new ideas. In 1987, the team was approved, and the group would grow quickly. Steve Sackerman gathered a team of engineers and moved into an abandoned warehouse in Cupertino. They got to work brainstorming and building. The new device, for now, in their imagination, would be called the Apple Newton. Reason being, the original Apple logo was Isaac Newton sitting under a tree, so the name Newton made sense. The Newton researchers began work on an iPad-like device. Steve Sackerman envisioned a tablet computer the size of a folded A4 sheet of paper, the price was to be the same as a desktop computer at the time. Being aware of all the developments going on in tech at the time, he incorporated touchscreens, hand recognition, a hard disk, and even an infrared port so Newtons could communicate with each other wirelessly. Separately, Apple upper management had been toying with a similar idea. CEO John Scully commissioned two high-budget video mock-ups of a product called the Knowledge Navigator in 1986. Here's a sample. Let me see the lecture notes from last semester. No, that's not enough. I need to review more recent literature. Pull up all the new articles I haven't read yet. Journal articles only? Mm -hmm, fine. Your friend Jill Gilbert has published an article about deforestation in the Amazon. Excuse me, Jill Gilbert is calling back. Great, put her through. Hi Mike, what's up? Is this one of your typical last minute panics for lecture material? <laughs> It would be great if you were available to make a few comments. Nothing formal. You know, I have a simulation that shows the spread of the Sahara over the last 20 years. Here, let me show you. Nice. Very nice. I've got some maps of the Amazon area during the same time. Let's put these together. Hmm, interesting. I can definitely use this. 
Thanks for your time, Jill. I really appreciate it. No problem. But next time I'm in Berkeley, you're buying the dinner. Dinner, right. See ya, 4.15. Bye-bye. While you were busy, your mother called again to remind you to pick up the birthday cake. Mm, fine, fine, fine. Um, print this article before I go. Now printing. Okay, I'm going to lunch now. Unfortunately for the Newton team, the reality of late 1980s technology didn't really live up to the dream. Prototype tablets had major issues. Handwriting recognition just didn't work. Different writing styles were proving impossible for the device to understand. And with handwriting being the primary input method for the device, this was a disaster. Eventually, the software was improved a little, but still needed a large amount of work. Meanwhile, Apple as a company was still doing okay, but was becoming over-reliant on the sales of the Macintosh computer. To make matters worse, Compaq, Gateway, and Dell were all on the rise. With only less than 10% of the computing market, things were going to get a whole lot worse for Apple. Perhaps the Newton being a completely new product category was just the thing Apple needed to turn things around. Meanwhile, a second team within Apple was also working on a portable device called the Pocket Crystal. It had three processors, a battery that lasted for weeks at a time, and weighed 8 pounds, or 3.6 kilograms. However, the cost would be 8,000 US dollars. Due to separate and internal struggle, Sackerman left Apple in 1990. The project would continue though under the leadership of Larry Tesla, formerly of Xerox Park. He was impressed by the Newton and provided a detailed demonstration to Apple's upper management in 1991. John Scully loved the idea and decided to run with it over the Pocket Crystal. Interestingly, the Pocket Crystal would later spin out into a separate company called General Magic, a company that almost invented an iPhone-like device but failed just at the last moment. This may be a story for another episode. So, it was 1991. Scully had the revolutionary product that was going to save Apple. A tablet computer with a touchscreen. Although the screen was resistive touch and had no multi-touch capabilities, it was to be revolutionary for its time. Such a device was a new concept, so the team argued about what size it should be. The original plan was to have three models. A 9 by 12 inch model, costing about $5,000, and then a 6 by 9 inch model, costing $2,000, and a 4.5 by 7 inch, costing 500. After much arguing, it was decided that the smaller size would be the best option. John Scully would make a plan for the Newton to ship in April of 1992, a tight deadline by any standard. He was so excited that he didn't wait for the development to finish before announcing it to the public in January of 1992. He made the announcement at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. A public demo would be held in Chicago a few months later. Scully, while being able to sell the idea of the Newton, didn't understand the intricacies of getting the device consumer ready. So, the Apple engineers got to work, and work they did. They were trying to kill thousands of bucks. During this time, 15 to 20 hour days weren't uncommon. As development continued, it became clear that the processor wasn't going to be powerful enough to keep up with the software demands, so they decided to switch to an ARM processor. Luckily for them, it turned out both to be faster and more efficient at running code. They were far from being in the clear though. As the demo drew closer, the Newton was still unreliable. Units would sometimes get too hot to handle because of faulty power managers. As the team practiced demonstrations of key features like faxing and beaming information wirelessly via infrared, the Newton would fail more often than it succeeded. The big day arrived in Chicago and Apple showed off their latest device, now called the Newton Message Pad. All of the message pads were tethered to Macs. They were just too unreliable to run independently. The engineers demonstrated some shape recognition and showed off the user interface. The press was alight with excitement, and to them, it seemed like the Newton was ready to ship. But behind the scenes, the device was far from being done. For the Apple engineers, there was a sigh of relief but then a slow realization that this had become the ultimate pressure cooker situation. As development continued, more problems arose. Getting the Newton consumer ready was proving to be a massive challenge. The release date was pushed back to August 1993. The press became unhappy about this and labeled the device vaporware. The company would showcase the product again at the Consumer Electronics Show in 1993, this time without tethering to a Macintosh. 
In an effort to get the product ready, countless weeks of 16-hour days took its toll on many of the Apple employees working on the Newton project. Some quit, and others simply cried. Relationships suffered, and mental health was left in the dust. According to the New York Times, as the deadline closed in, 30-year-old software engineer Ko Asono couldn't take it anymore and sadly took his own life in December of 1992. Within a week, another programmer had a breakdown, ending up in prison after attacking his roommate. For those of you who have seen the making of the iPhone documentary, all of this pressure would ring a bell. Due to these tragic events, Apple would introduce a buddy mental health program, and this was to help engineers who were on the verge of burning out from intense work. Even a day before the next consumer electronics show, Newtons were failing without warning, and the batteries were getting eaten alive by faulty power management. The team was not confident in their success. But miraculously, everything worked as planned on the day. As the software moved into beta in May, almost 4,000 bugs were found. Most of these were sorted by the end of the month, but it was still too buggy to ship. The staff were pushed even harder than ever before. Finally, despite all of this, the Newton message pad rolled out in August of 1993 at Macworld. By this point, much of the original hype had died down as it was over a year past its original launch date. It had also promised too much. The wireless features, which were a major selling point, didn't make it at launch. Selling for $6.99, the first version of the Newton could recognise printed and handwritten text. It had a library of a thousand words, and could learn more, like a modern smartphone does today. Because of the buggy software, the early press sentiment wasn't positive. Even The Simpsons would make a mockery of the handwriting recognition. Hey Dolph, take a memo on your Newton. Beat up Martin. Although there was an on-screen keyboard, handwriting was the primary method of interfacing with the device, so buggy text recognition was less than ideal. By 1995, in a newer version called the MessagePad 120, a lot of these software bugs were fixed. In 1997, Apple would spin off the Newton division into a new company. They would be in charge of selling the best version yet, the MessagePad 2000. It had a relatively quick 166 MHz processor, a larger 2 MB of removable storage, 1 MB of RAM, and a higher 480p resolution display. And though the screen would still be hard to read at times, it would be a modest success. It finally looked like the Newton would be the future direction of Apple. The Newton company even got their own logo, Apple employees, and even a separate board of directors. Apple was losing money in 1997, so the plan was to gain outside investment into the new Newton company. The standalone Newton company would go public in 1999. It wasn't to be though. As soon as Steve Jobs took back control of Apple in 1998, he made the decision to cut the Newton project completely. Steve Jobs wanted to focus the company's efforts in a more concentrated and cohesive direction. In its five years on the market, the Newton only sold around 200,000 units. For comparison, in its first five years, the iPhone sold over 130 million units. Although it was clear that there was something to be said for mobile computing back then, it was perhaps too early and too ambitious. Looking back from the future, it's easy to see that web browsing would have been the killer app for the Newton, but the first commercial web browser was only released in 1993. While the Newton was being made, there really was no vision of what mobile web browsing could look like, it just didn't really exist at the time. Interestingly, a mobile web browser called Hopper was made for the later versions of the Newton, but it was too little, too late. Ultimately, the Newton was a product in search for a problem to solve. It was too expensive for casual buyers, but too underpowered for business users. The Newton's legacy does live on as the great-grandfather to all smartphones, and also its popularisation of the ARM processor. Before we continue, I just want to give a shout out to today's sponsor, AppSumo. As creators and entrepreneurs, we wear a lot of hats. Social media, project management, sales, accounting, copywriting, just to name a few. AppSumo is the leading digital marketplace for entrepreneurs and the best way to automate the busy work that comes with running a business. 
Last Black Friday, AppSumo gave away a Tesla, and this year, they're taking their $1 million Black Friday budget and giving it away to any creator who lists a product on AppSumo. There's also an additional $10,000 for 10 randomly chosen lucky creators. List your product on AppSumo before November the 17th and grab your share of their $1 million Black Friday marketing fund, plus a chance to be one of 10 lucky winners randomly chosen to win an additional $10,000. So, in summary, ultimately, three things doomed the Newton. Number one, early negative press. Number two, a lack of internet connectivity. And number three, a CEO who didn't deeply understand the technology he was touting or just how much work it would take to bring it to life in a polished way. The Newton team recognized the loss of 30-year-old Mr. Isono, in which the pressure of the project contributed to him ending his life. If you type in a special command, the Newton screen will say, in memory of Ko Isono, the Newton story is one of dedication, personal sacrifice, and a product that was too early, promising too much while delivering too little. In the world of technology, timing is everything. If we include the mental toll that it took on Apple's staff and the tragic loss of Mr. Isono, the Apple Newton was without a doubt Apple's greatest failure because all of this effort went into a project that was immediately scrapped with the return of Steve Jobs. So what do you guys think? Let me know in the comment section below. If you want to discuss this video, head on over to the Cold Fusion Discord. If you want to see a similar episode on the development of the iPhone and the behind the scenes pressure that went on, I'll leave a link to that Cold Fusion episode below as well. Anyway, that's it from me. My name is Dagogo, and you've been watching Cold Fusion, and I'll catch you again soon for the next episode. Cheers, guys. Have a good one.